I don't know. I think a lot of you at least have tried the homework, but there is one specific question on the homework, number three, which was tougher than the rest, I thought. Uh, and Professor Kim and I agreed that it was best to just go over it really briefly. So I sort of, uh, I'm going to go over it quite quickly. If there are any questions about it, uh, if there are any quick questions about it, I can answer them now. But I think if there are any sort of in-depth questions, uh, not now would be the best time because we do have to go over material in a lecture. But um, I did want to try to clarify this a little bit. So uh, the question is asking, it says in Irvine, the pressure is 1 atm, the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, and the abundance of ozone in the atmosphere is 70 parts per billion. And in Denver, it says there's 0 0.8 atm of pressure, 25 degrees Celsius again, and 65 ppb of ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, it also, oh, whoops. It also says that in 1 atm, there are 2.5 times 10 to the 19 molecules in every centimeter cubed. So in every tiny little centimeter cubed, there's 2.5 times 10 to the 19th molecules. And it's asking you, in a given volume, what is the number of ozone molecules in Irvine divided by the number of ozone molecules in Denver? So that's the, what you're trying to get to. So um, the, one of the keys to this, there's sort of two main concepts, I think, and that's the proportionality of pressure to this uh, moles per volume, as well as this idea of um, number densities and mixing ratios, which I think we've talked about a little bit. But uh, so this is the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume equals moles times R, which is the gas constant, times temperature. So if you mathematically move the V volume over to the right side of the equation, you get this pressure equals moles per volume times R times temperature. So that proves that pressure is proportional to moles divided by volume. So this moles divided by volume um, is kind of the same as molecules per volume. Um, the difference between molecules and moles is that there's 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in a mole. That's the definition of a mole. But um, anyway, yeah, so in 1 atm, there's 2.5 times 10 to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed. So in Irvine, where there is one atm of pressure, we would expect that number of molecules in a centimeter cube. Uh, but in Denver, there is 0 0.8 atm of pressure. So that's 80% of the pressure that there is in Irvine. So based on this idea that pressure and moles per volume are proportional, you would expect 80% of the number of molecules in a centimeter cubed in Denver as you would in Irvine. So based on that, uh, we can determine that in Irvine, we said there's 2.5 times 10 to the 19th. So in 0 0.8 atm equals pressure conditions, we would expect 0 0.8 times 2.5 times 10 to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed. And if it helps, you can think of this as like 0 0.8 atm divided by 1.0 atm. And so that's going to give us a number of 2.0 times 10 raised to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed. So now these uh, molecules per centimeter cubed, that's a number density, those units, molecules per centimeter cubed. Um, and we have these number densities. So this is Denver conditions. There's 2.0 times 10 to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed. And these are Irvine conditions. And we also know the concentrations of ozone relative to a billion molecules. So we can say that in Irvine, oh, lost the cap. So in Irvine, uh, we can say there's 2.5 times 10 to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed. And of all those molecules, 70 out of a billion of them are going to be ozone, because it's 70 parts per billion. So out of that, we can multiply that times 70 over a billion. A billion also is 10 to the 9th. So 2.5 times 10 to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed times 70 ozone molecules per you can write this out, ozone molecules per atmosphere molecules. So
So that's going to give us the concentration of ozone in Irvine. We use these, the brackets, the square brackets around the compound of interest to denote concentration. So um, that's how you get the concentration of ozone in Irvine. So that is going to be in units of molecules ozone per centimeter cubed. Those are the units of that. And then we can do the same thing in Denver. So 2.5 times, oh, so in Denver, right, we determined that there was 2.0 times 10 to the 19th molecules per centimeter cubed. So in Denver, there's going to be 2.0 times 10 to the 19th. Is there a question? No? OK, no one. Uh, molecules per centimeter cubed. And we're going to multiply that by the mixing ratio in Denver, which is 65 ozone molecules for every 10 to the 9th atmosphere molecules. And that is going to give us the concentration of ozone in Denver. And that's going to be in units of molecules ozone per centimeter cubed. So if we go back to the beginning of the question, it's asking, in a given volume, what is the number of ozone molecules in Irvine divided by number of ozone molecules in Denver. So if we say that our given volume here is a centimeter cubed, then these concentration values are going to give us number of molecules per centimeter cubed, number of molecules per centimeter cubed. So in a given volume of one centimeter cubed, we can plug this in here and this in there to get the answer. I know it's kind of a tough question. And there's a lot of steps to it. Um, but for that reason, we just wanted to throw it up on the board. So you can feel free to sort of look at that after class and think about it. And if there are any questions, yeah, please. What's our final answer? Is it the non-unit or the unitless? It is going to be unitless, yeah, because it's the same units on top as on the bottom. And so when you divide by itself, it, it cancels out the units there. Yeah, good question. Uh, anyway, so if there are any questions about that, please let me know. Um, Cool. So on to the lecture if there aren't any questions. So uh, we talked in, that's some, I think maybe the second class in the course, that there are six uh, air pollutants. Oh, I can turn off these front ones now. Uh, is that OK? OK. So we talked about how there are six air pollutants, which are recognized legislatively by the EPA. So those are the nitrogen oxides, NO and NO2, sulfur dioxide, SO2, uh, carbon monoxide, CO, lead, uh, particulate matter, and ozone. That's the sixth one. So today we're going to talk about particulate matter. So uh, particulate matter is going to be like um, liquid or solid. Uh, and in the aerosol form, that's when it's suspended in air. Uh, that's what we're sort of interested in. So um, we're going to be talking about particulate pollution today. So we have a few pictures of it to start off. So uh, this is Salt Lake City. So this is all human pollution or mostly human pollution. So as you might be able to uh, guess or infer, when you have a lot of particulate matter, a lot of liquids and solids suspended in the air, it's going to influence visibility a lot. Um, so you can see that you can't really see the city at all here. Um, so this is winter air. It's really stagnant, so it hasn't really flushed out all this particulate matter that accumulates from fossil fuel burning over time. Uh, this is Mexico City. Again, lots of cars, lots of combustion, so you get lots of human uh, emission uh, particulates. Sao Paulo, Beijing. This is the, um, the Olympic Stadium, the bird's nest over there to the right. Uh, this is New Delhi. So yeah. Um, so I don't know what you guys think of when you think of particulate matter. Uh, but these particles that we're thinking of are going to be quite small. They're going to uh, span seven different orders of magnitude, which means um, each order of magnitude is a times 10. So there is, they do span a wide range. But generally, when we're talking about uh, particulate matter, at least the stuff that the EPA regulates for, it's PM10 and below. So PM10 means that refers to the number of particulate molecules that are 
in diameter less than 10 micrometers or 10 micron. A micrometer and a micron is the same thing. So uh, if we think of human hair, that's going to be 50 to 70 microns wide. And a fine beach sand particle is going to be about 90 micrometers wide. And uh, these particulate matters that we're thinking of, particulates are either 10 micrometers wide, 2.5 micrometers wide. There is more range, but those tend to be the ones that people talk about a lot in connection with human health. Um, yeah, and there are issues with these things in California, which we'll talk about a little bit, but yeah. Um, so micro, of course, being times 10 to the negative 6. So just in the way a kilometer is 10 to the 3 meters, these micrometers are 10 to the negative 6 meters. Okay. Um, so when you think about uh, these particles being moved all around the global atmosphere, you have to think about the size and the amount of time it takes them to fall. So a lot of these things will be removed from the atmosphere just by depositing, by settling out. Uh, they reach a place where there's less uh, high speed winds or something like that, and they'll just settle out to the ground. But the reason why we don't see really large particles floating around the air is because they fall to the ground more quickly. So this is the uh, diameter of a given particle and the average time it would take to fall one kilometer in the atmosphere. So the result of this really is just that you don't see um, particles floating around in the atmosphere that are sort of you know less than 100 uh, micrometers. So um, yeah, so the only the really small things are going to stay suspended, which also means that those are sort of more severe when they do get uh, sent out or loaded into the atmosphere because they stick around longer. So um, yeah, only particles smaller than 10 millimeters reach the atmosphere, or reach the global atmosphere, yeah. So um, particles also will change in the atmosphere. So they'll go up and they'll undergo physical um, changes or chemical changes. And so the particle that they are when they first are emitted into the atmosphere might differ from what they are later on. So if you have an externally mixed particle, that means its composition in the atmosphere is going to be the same as it was when it was first emitted into the atmosphere. Whereas an internal mixture, and we're going to talk about some of the ways that particles can change once they do get emitted, but um, an external mixture is going to be different from when it was first emitted. So if you get some molecule that's emitted from a combustion engine and then it floats around and then sticks to some other particles or goes through chemical dissolution into a water droplet or something like that, uh, that would be an example of internal mixing. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Let's see. Oh yeah, so um, these are interactions between um, large and small particles. So one of those physical changes that I was just talking about uh, could be what we call soot inclusion. So soot is one of the more toxic particulate matters, so it uh, is responsible for a lot of the health effects. And a lot of the time you can see here there's all these soot particles actually getting absorbed into these larger particles. So when small and large particles interact, a lot of the time the smaller one will go inside the larger particle. Uh, so that's what's happening here. And they show sizes here. But also, um, Particles can come in lots of shapes and sizes. So something like this obviously is not a round particle. Um, and we would measure the distance of this the entire diameter across. So uh, yeah, just something to think about. That they come in many different shapes, many different sizes, different chemical compositions. Because a, part a particle in the atmosphere, an aerosol, is just a piece of liquid or solid suspended in the air. So when you think about that, that really could come in lots of different, come from lots of different places be in lots of different forms. Uh, so these are just more examples of particulate matter in the atmosphere. So ash, combusted plant fiber, elongated ash, soil dust. Uh, we'll talk more um, about more of them as we go on. But you know, there could be so many different things, like pollen, or water off the ocean, or like when tires go along against asphalt, sometimes it like sprays these really small rubber particles out. So. There's just there's so many different places where they can come from. Um, oh yeah, so uh, this is a range of different particle sizes and their number density. So we were just talking about number density over there. So it's the number uh, in a given volume. So uh, something just to point out here is just, and this might be expected, but 
the really small aerosols are going to have higher abundance. So um, we'll learn about how sometimes small molecules can coagulate and grow into larger particle sizes. Uh, but there are more of the small mo molecules than there are the large ones. So these are diameters and number densities. And then these are hydrometeor particles. So these are different forms of like precipitation. So fog and cloud, drizzle, raindrops, and hail. And then they give uh, the diameter and number density of those as well. So this sort of gives an idea of the distribution of them and how there's just many, many fewer of them once you get up to large particle size. Certainly, if there are any questions in any of this, please raise your hand and ask. Um, yeah. So um, these particle sizes, they tend, we tend to think of them in three different modes. Generally, the nucleation, accumulation, and coarse mode. Um, and these size distributions, the, each of these size distributions, we think of them as sort of like size bins. So uh, the aerosols tend to prefer to end up in one of these three sizes. Uh, we will again go into this a little later on. But uh, yeah, think about these aerosols as being in three distinct size distribution uh, curves. Uh, so the sources of particles can be varied, as we discussed. Um, but three of the main uh, naturally occurring ones are sea spray. So that's coming off of waves a lot of the time, or air bubbles bursting at the surface of the ocean. Uh, soil dust, so this is maybe off of like a really arid land or a desert. A wind will come along and just pick up a bunch of uh, soil dust particles and bring them into the air. And then volcanoes, um, I'm sure you've all seen like a big volcanic eruption. It just spews all this smoke and ash and debris into the air. So that will, be, that will lead to particulate aerosol loading into the atmosphere. Um, biomass burning, that can be anthropogenic or biogenic. Anthropogenic meaning uh, human caused, biogenic meaning naturally occurring. So uh, biomass burning, like humans can burn wood, for example, or they can like clear an area for farmland by burning it all down, stuff like that. Or lightning can um, cause plane fires or forest fires and uh, certainly I lived in Colorado for six years before moving to California last year. And there's lots of issues with forest fires there. I know there are here as well. Um, and I lived in Uganda for a little while, and we had lots of plains fires there as well. And then these are two uh, examples of strictly human. So fossil fuel combustion, that's obviously like coal and oil being burned uh, in engines or in um, furnaces. And then industrial, there's lots of industrial processes, uh, aside from just the combusting of fossil fuels, which can lead to this release of particulate matter into the atmosphere. Cool. So sea spray emission. Um, this is uh, especially when there's like really high winds and stuff like that. You can see you know, white water in, when you see waves that are crashing. And when you look out to the ocean, it's all like those white waves coming crashing down. So those are going to be releasing spray out into the atmosphere. Or if you've ever been behind a wave, I'm sure there's plenty of surfers in here who behind a wave, sometimes you can see these waves crashing and just spraying water out into the atmosphere. But, um, and then the other thing is there's lots of air bubbles in the water. And they'll come up, and then they'll pop and uh, release these sort of like breaks of water into the atmosphere. So um, they can't contain the same chemical composition of seawater. Um, which logically makes sense because these are just pieces of water that have already been in the ocean popping and, and spraying around. Um, and yeah, so the larger drops occur um, when the winds are, are tearing off the top of these crests, so that white water um, when you look out to ocean. Uh, and then there's one of the influences of this is sea spray acidification. So I don't know if you've heard of uh, one of the issues with climate change and increasing carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere is there's an issue with acidification of ocean water. Um, anyway, so sometimes you can get a reduction in chloride, in chloride in these sea spray drops when you get, uh, they go into the atmosphere for a brief amount of time. And they can react with um, atmospheric constituents, or just things that are in the atmosphere. Uh, and then they come back in a different chemical form. So uh, yeah, and then you can also have water loss when they just evaporate away. Uh, and then, as I just mentioned, the, the chemical composition of these sea spray particles are, is going to be very similar to the ocean water. 
So mostly water. And then sodium and chlorine are both high. And that's because uh, sodium chlorine, the bonded sodium chlorine, that's uh, table salt, NaCl. So um, we expect since salt water. So those are high, but yeah. Uh, so this is the soil dust. So um, here, this is the west coast of Africa and Spain and Portugal up there. And um, coming across the Sahara are lots of easterlies. So these are winds that blow from east to west. Uh, and as they're blowing from east to west, the Sahara obviously is very dry. And it'll pick up a lot of these dust particles. And then they'll take them out over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and a lot of the time, they'll deposit in the ocean. Uh, but this is just a picture of this um, one of these big dust loading events. Um, when I say loading, uh, I just to clarify, that's like loading the atmosphere with particles. Uh, that's what I mean by that. So this is a big dust loading event because lots of it's getting pushed up into the atmosphere. Uh, so soil dust emission, um, it all comes from soil and soil comes from rocks. So just a little bit about how you can get to the conditions where you can get soil dust loading. So um, Soil is this natural unconsolidated mineral and organic matter lying above bedrock on the surface of the earth. And it comes from the breakdown of rocks and of organic matter. Uh, and rocks, there's three types of rocks typically. Um, so sedimentary is when you get like at the bottom of a lake bed or a river bed or something like that, when you get lots of pieces of small pieces of rock, dust and stuff like that, that all lands in the same area. And then over time, it gets pressurized or something like that. Uh, and it gets um, consolidated and condensed into one piece of rock. Uh, igneous is straight from volcanoes. So you'll get magma coming up. And depending on how it cools, you'll get large crystals or small crystals. But this is straight from a volcano. And metamorphic can be either a sedimentary or igneous rock, which then gets put under really high temperature and pressure conditions and changes a little bit. Um, and then the rocks, the way they break down, is either we call weathering, which is just the breakdown of rocks into soil. And uh, there's physical weathering and chemical weathering. So an example of physical weathering is, um, for example, water might go down and then uh, into the rock. And then there's a cold spell. And so it all freezes. And there's physical pressure applied to that rock. And, uh, and it cracks, for example, something like that. Or wind coming across. Sometimes you see, like, um, in certain regions where there's like soft rock formations, that there's big like areas where wind has come and carved out holes or ridges or something like that. So that would be physical weathering. Chemical weathering. Um, this is an example of chemical weathering down here. So you, this is uh, gypsum. So gypsum is a white rock, uh, a, and it's made up of calcium sulfate and two waters. And so if those dissociate and they become a calcium ion and a sulfate ion and liquid water, and then that water then travels downstream, for example, and then those things dry up and they can reform as gypsum, then it's not going to be part of the big rock anymore. It'll be a smaller piece. It'll have been weathered away, and so it's somewhere else. Um, hope that's clear. Yeah. But physical weathering and chemical weathering, they're two distinct processes processes which lead from rock to soil. Yeah. Uh, so uh, desertification, um, which is the process of having more deserts, not deserts, uh, that is something that's an issue with climate change. Because with climate change, you get all these changes in precipitation regimes. So for example, the southwest of the United States is expected to get much drier. So that'll lead to. Um, more deserts being around. And then as a result of that, you'll get this increased soil dust loading into the atmosphere. So um, you know, if you had like a bunch of flour on the table and you went, it would all go up into the air. But if you poured water all over it and then blew, none of it would come up. So um, the more water, the less of this dust loading you get. Uh, so the places where it really is an issue is here in the sort of Western United States region, around Africa, the Middle East, and Australia. Um, and obviously, there's lots of sort of socio-political economic implications for all of this stuff, which, uh, yeah, are really important to consider as we're moving forward into the future. So yeah, 
And then something to, that's kind of interesting to think about with this is we're talking about human pollution a lot of the time, but is something like this, is this something we would define as human pollution? Does anyone have a response to that? Well, it's something, I mean, I don't have a, a totally uh, clear response to it either. It's not pollution probably as defined by the EPA, um, but it'll definitely lose, uh, lead to degraded air quality conditions. And the climate change which is leading to this desertification is, uh, it seems likely that it's human caused. So um, yeah, anyway, that's something interesting to think about in my opinion. Um, so uh, this is um, a dust storm that came out of the Gobi Desert in the spring. And you can just see this, uh, the movement of it across this week going from Eastern Asia over to the Western United States. Um, so it takes a while to move and uh, it can take a week to get there. But this is uh, sort of, in my opinion, a good reason why air pollution and air quality control is a really important international issue, which is that regardless of where it's emitted from, um, it goes across borders and can influence everyone around the world. So um, yeah, so that's the movement of a dust, a dust cloud from Asia to Western United States. And you can see, um, I'm sure many of you are aware, that there's a lot of issues with air quality in especially China, but in lots of regions in Eastern Asia, uh, people wearing masks and stuff. And I know the president of China has put like a lot of emphasis on atmospheric science labs to um, sort of try to speed up the process because they're worried about it leading to stuff like political instability and stuff because it's really bad over there. It's quite scary. Um, but yeah. But it's not all bad, fortunately. These sandstorms are actually kind of an important process in the uh, geo, uh, the biogeochemical cycle, basically. So um, if you look at this here, this is uh, average sea surface chlorophyll 1998 to 2006. So in this, chlorophyll is being used as a proxy basically for um, biological productivity in the ocean. So uh, the dark blue and the purple, these are regions of very, very little productivity and up green, yellow, and orange are regions of higher productivity. So um, we remember that dust storm that came in or moved off of the west coast of Africa and deposited in the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see there's this region here where there's increased productivity. And that's because these dust storms have really high iron concentrations. And iron is thought to be one of the limiting nutrients in a lot of these biological ecosystems. So when you have these big dust storms, which carry lots and lots of dust out of the Sahara Desert and deposit it into the Atlantic Ocean, you get increased productivity. So um, there's been lots of sort of interesting iron fertilization experiments trying to combat climate change where uh, they think that if you increase iron a lot in the oceans, then uh, the, there's increased biological productivity and there's an increased carbon dioxide sink into the ocean because these, um, remember we talked about photosynthesis, how it's uh, carbon dioxide, which they're turning into energy. So um, yeah, so the, it is an important process and the phytoplankton and bacteria, zooplankton, they depend on iron. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is a volcano, uh, Sarashev volcano, June 2009. So uh, you can see just lots and lots of particulate matter being released into the atmosphere. Uh, yep, really cool picture from NASA. Uh, and volcanic emission, there's 500 volcanoes which are currently active. Uh, water vapor makes up 50 to 80 percent of the gas mass here and the magma itself is one to four percent um, gas by mass. And these are the constituents that make up the vapor. So there's carbon dioxide and carbonyl sulfide, carbon monoxide, diatomic sulfur, diatomic chlorine, diatomic fluorine, hydrochloric acid, diatomic nitrogen, and sulfur dioxide and diatomic hydrogen. So you don't need to know those, but um, they're interesting uh, to me at least. Um, and then out of these particles, the most abundant are silicate. So uh, that's an, a silicon atom bonded with some oxygen. Uh, and those range in size from 0 0.1 to 100 millimeters. Uh, and then 
like the thing with dust loading, there are sort of other impacts of volcanic activity. And a lot of them are considered as uh, potential ways to try to get out of some of the detrimental effects of climate change. So um, when these uh, volcanoes release these big emissions into the atmosphere, and industry can play a role in emitting these things as well. But SO2 is one of the gases we just saw on that last slide. And SO2 can evaporate into the atmosphere, or condense rather, into sulfuric acid. And that creates this sulfate haze. And that is going to influence the radiative exchange between Earth and space. So um, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the actual sort of mechanism of global warming. But basically, there's been too much energy that's coming in that we're trapping and not letting go back out to space. And the, the greenhouse gases are the ones that are trapping those. So what this is doing is this, these, this sunlight coming in, this energy rays coming in, they're being reflected off of this sulfate haze and going back out to space. And so that is increasing our exchange with space going out. So that is going to decrease cl climate change. Um, you don't need to know the sort of specific mechanisms, but it is worth noting that these volcanoes can have a cooling effect on the planet when they um, erupt. And this was uh, Mount Pinatubo, which was this really large volcano that went off in the early 90s in the Philippines. Um, yeah, so this is a picture of it. Um, it sent stuff something like 10 miles into the atmosphere. Really enormous, uh, very aggressive eruption. And this is temperature difference in degrees Celsius year to year. And so if you're going along, you can actually see that there was cooling that year. And that is attributed to that volcano. Um, so yeah. And then also, these things play a role in being cloud condensation nuclei. So uh, the in, there's an interaction between humidity in the atmosphere and these particles that form clouds. So uh, these can seed clouds as well. So they can increase cloud production. Uh, and then, I don't know how many of you remember, but in 2010 there was <laughs> the eruption of that one, which I'm not going to have a go at. Um, and that ended up leading to a six-day suspension in transatlantic air traffic. So this is the cloud from that volcano. You can see it's just really, really enormous and uh, wide-reaching. So you can see how something like that would really have an influence on, on the entire global energy balance. Uh, so biomass burning, um, it's the burning of evergreen forests, deciduous forests, woodlands, grasslands, agricultural land uh, for a number of reasons. And the constituents coming out of a biomass burning are carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, the nitrogen oxides, NO and NO2, sulfur dioxide, methane, and ROG, which stands for reactive organic gases. And you can think of an ROG in exactly the same way you would think of a VOC. So VOC stands for volatile organic compounds. This is reactive organic gases. It's essentially the same thing. Um, and so, yeah, so this is basically from uh, um, incomplete combustion of organic materials. You get the emission of these VOCs. So, yeah. And then the particle composition or constituents that come out of this are ash and plant fibers, soil dust, organic matter, and soot. Um, so uh, this is a grass fire, February of 2009. This is a savanna fire in Kenya. So uh, especially in dry conditions, uh, you can have these forest fires or plains fires. And so something to consider as well when we think about that increased de desertification uh, of the world, that it's likely to lead to increased forest fires as well, or just uh, natural fires. And then um, the health impacts of biomass burning are certainly recognized by the CDC, Center for Disease Control. Um, so even though the influence of biomass burning is not directly controlled by the EPA under air pollution, they do recognize that it has negative health impacts. And you can go to these websites and learn more about them. Uh, so part of why we care so much about the size of these particles is because the distribution of where they get deposited in your respiratory system is a direct function of their size. So um, the, the worst health impacts come from the ones that are deposited way down 
in your lungs. So those ones generally, uh, th your lungs aren't going to be able to remove stuff that gets down there. And so they uh, get dissolved into your bloodstream, stuff like that. So those are going to be especially the 0.01 diameter particles. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this is on a log scale. So each tick is 10 times the value of the tick before it here versus just being a linear. It's exponentially increasing. Um, so, yep, so this 0.01 micrometer is going to be really bad uh, just because they all deposit here in this lower region. And then the ones that are deposited up uh, near your nasal region, uh, those are the really large ones and the really, really small ones. Uh, but it's these ones that get into this middle range that are, uh, can be quite dangerous. So, yep. But that at least gives you a reason why it'd be um, yeah. Uh, so fossil fuels, um, this is where we get most of our energy. Uh, so it's the burning of um, organic materials, which have been uh, processed over a really long time into sort of a, these fuels, coal and oil. So there's lots of different types of coal uh, that exist on Earth. And they all have sort of different energy outputs. and um, and there are sort of different levels of being clean or not clean. But um, yep, coal, especially in the States. I think the States actually has the highest coal reserves, I believe, in the world. Uh, and then oil as well. So uh, when we burn fossil fuels, sometimes there's incomplete combustion, uh, which leads to the production of ROG and CO, CH4. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't Remember, the complete combustion is uh, C6, H12, O6 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. And here I just chose glucose, but you can, anytime you have a hydro hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen, complete combustion is going to lead to production of CO2 and H2O. So CO2 is a gas that's emitted, but it's from complete combustion. That's the only thing I just want to say about that. And then the particles from this are soot, organic material alone, SO4, 2 minus, and then metals and fly ash. How do you get incomplete combustion? Like there's not enough oxygen? Yeah, that's right. It could be not enough oxygen, not enough heat. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Can you repeat again what the incomplete combustion um, gases are? are so there, it's going to be any organic material, which is not carbon dioxide. So in that case, this is carbon monoxide, CH4, which is methane, and ROG, ROG which is a reactive organic gas. So uh, that's going to contain carbon in it as well. And then fly ash, um, which contains oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, and magnesium. This leads to some heavy metal poisoning issues because uh, iron and magnesium are heavy metals, and so there's issues with that as well. Um, why is it such a big problem? Like, it seems like to complete a combustion is such a simple solution. So. Well, it's, it's tough because there's so many, like for each molecule to combust completely requires certain conditions. So in a combustion engine, there's just, there's so many molecules, there's, I don't know. You're saying that it, it that you feel like it wouldn't be tough to go have complete combustion? I just feel like it's something that like people could fix, you know? Yeah. Well, my you know, that's probably true. They probably do increase the efficiency of the combustion over time, but part of that probably is that they're more expensive engines that have more complete combustion because you're going to get higher energy outputs if you have complete combustion, but you have to like have a constant source of oxygen in that's um it has a molar ratio with the fuel that you have. So you have to have known amounts. And on top of that, there's in a given fuel, there might be lots of different types of organic compounds. So you can have propane and butane and propylene and lots of different methane, for example. So you also don't really know necessarily what's in there exactly all the time. But um, yeah, it would definitely increase energy output if you could have complete combustion. Um, but also, complete combustion releases a lot of carbon dioxide. So that's not even. I mean, carbon dioxide is an issue for us as well. So, in general, I think it's agreed that it would be best to try to 
remove ourselves from fossil fuel combustion industry. But, yeah. um, and then I just want to mention that fossil fuels can come in lots of different lots of different places, uh, a lot of them being transport, so boats and trains, certainly cars use fossil engines, uh, and then all of the power plants use fossil engines. So this is stuff that uh, even though a lot of us maybe don't feel super positive about the fact that we live on an industry that's dependent on fossil fuels, it's something that we all benefit from, something worth recognizing. That, uh, yeah. So industrial emission, uh, so the idea of this is that it's slightly different from the fossil fuel emission specifically, but uh, I'm sure a lot of these use combustion engines in their processing. But um, so smelters, that's where they take like an iron ore or some metal ore and they refine it into that metal. Uh, oil fired or coal fired power plants that we just talked about. Municipal waste incineration, waste incineration uh, that's when they burn trash, which they do in LA. Uh, and then steel mill furnaces um, where they produce steel. Um, and then you can get these different uh, production, the production of these different metals and the fly ash coming off of these. And so uh, there's more heavy metals in this that we would have to worry about, including lead and mercury. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the sources, um, but we also wanted to talk about what happens to them once they get up into the atmosphere. So we're going to discuss particle-particle and particle-gas interactions. Uh, so we'll go through these uh, more slowly, but this is the list of them. So coagulation, this is how particles were, are going to grow in the atmosphere. So uh, a lot of these particles often are like quite sticky. And so imagine two of these particles sort of coming in the atmosphere and then they connect, go off together, become one larger particle. So this is how they can grow. Um, so that is the coagulation. Uh, so a particle sticks to another particle, coagulates, becomes a, bitter, a bigger particle. Nucleation is when two gas particles react together to produce a particle. Or sorry, uh, two gas molecules react together to form a particle. Uh, and then condensation is the interaction between a particle and a gas. So nucleation is gas-gas, coagulation is particle-particle, and condensation is particle and gas phase. And that's when a particle will absorb some uh, gas. And we will go farther into depth on this. Um, yeah. Oh, and then I, I, I think I mentioned it before, but I did want to say that um, these particles will eventually act as a cloud seed. So when you have really high concentrations of humidity and really high concentrations of these particles, you're likely to get production of clouds um, and this condensation thing. Cool. Try to mention a little bit later on uh, plays a role in that. So um, these nucleation, accumulation, and coarse mode, these are those bins that I was talking about, these size bins. So here is particle diameter and abundance. And so you can see that there's these three really distinct distributions of size class. So again, this is a log scale. So each tick is 10 times larger than the tick behind it. But this is the nucleation mode. This is the accumulation mode. And this is the coarse mode. And um, coagulation for example, or condensation, or nucleation, that's going to be how these things jump from bin to bin. And so now we have some, uh, this really cool experiment where they were measuring, so this is particle diameter on the x-axis and um, particle abundance, it's a number density on the y-axis. So uh, the red is day one and the blue is day two. So there was a big particle loading event. And so there were high concentrations of particles. And uh, a lot of them were in this small diameter region. And fewer of them in the larger diameter region. But after one day, due to whatever processes were happening in the atmosphere, you got these three distinct bin sizes, or bins. So um, if you think about it, comparison to that, one, two, three, sort of something similar in that. So. Hopefully you find that convincing, but yeah.
Uh, so condensation and evaporation, these are gas particle, gas dash particle interactions. So uh, condensation is where a gas gets absorbed into a particle, whereas evaporation is when gas is released from a particle. Uh, so we went, if we want to go back to those modes actually. So accumulation mode is that middle mode. The mode is the, the size bin. Each of these three are called modes. And uh, condensation, as I say, occurs primarily in the accu accumulation mode since it contains the largest surface area concentration of all the modes. So um, yeah, the surface area thing is uh, a little complicated, but it's just the relationship between the size and the number of particles uh, and the amount of surface area they show. So uh, water vapor condenses on accumulation and coarse mode particles to form these cloud drops, as we were saying. So again, clouds occur when there's high humidity and high particle concentrations. And then sulfuric acid, so um, not just water can interact with particles, but other liquids in the atmosphere. So sulfuric acid is an example of such a liquid. And condensation onto accumulation mode is going to affect visibility. It's also going to be sulfuric acid is the acid that causes acid rain, which we are going to talk about later on in the class. But um, there were issues with coals that had really high SO2 concentrations that led to high um, emission of sulfuric acid. Uh, or high, it led to high concentrations of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, and that led to acid rain. Um, yeah. So uh, this is sort of a summary of um, what's going on in a cloud. So there's, there can be lots of different processes going on simultaneously uh, to influence it. But again, I would just force home the idea that lots of particles and lots of humidity leads to cloud production. Uh, and then this is just an example particle of a yeah, an example of a particle which is attracting water vapor. So you can see how water is forming, these water droplets are forming around the particle. And then say one of these evaporates away. Um, so that would make it shrink, grow and shrink with this evaporation condensation. Um, so this is sort of a summary of all of that together. There's this uh, naturally occurring emissions industrial emissions. There are some processes which are reversible, some which aren't reversible. Uh, and then they play some role in the environment, um, whether it's playing a role in cloud seeding or playing a role in the radiative exchange of space. Uh, and then eventually they're deposited either on land or on the ground. But um, the cycle of particulate matter um, was important before the Industrial Revolution, and it still is. So even without uh, human influence on it, it still is an important cycle to know. Uh, and then we're going to get into a little bit of aqueous chemistry uh, just to finish off. But um, so aqueous chemistry is probably most of what you guys learned in high school when you were learning chemistry in high school. Um, so I'm sure you probably learned about like things precipitating out of a solution. So anytime you have a solution, that's aqueous chemistry. So it's basically wet chemistry. It's chemistry that involves a solution in water. So um, dissolution is the process by which a gas diffuses to and dissolves in a liquid or on a particle surface. So uh, the example of those particles attracting water vapor, that could be an example of that. A solvent is the liquid in which a gas dissolves. So if I'm right about the fact that you guys learned a lot of aqueous chemistry in high school, the solvent was usually water. Uh, a solute is what's being dissolved in the solvent. So it can be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. The solution is one or more solutes plus the solvent. So once you mix everything together, you have your solution. Uh, and then these are common dissolving gases. This is hydrochloric acid, uh, nitric acid, ammonia, and SO2, uh, sulfur dioxide. So yep. Uh, dissociation, so um, for example, uh, hydrochloric acid, it can be dissolved into a solution and then those bonds might um, 
fall apart. And so they'll dissociate into the solution. And instead of having a hydrochloric acid molecule, you'll have an H plus uh, cation, which is the positive ion, and a Cl minus anion, which is the negative ion, just floating around instead of actually being bonded. Um, so the breakdown of those molecules into ions is called dissociation. The positively charged ion, that's the cation. The negatively charged ion, that's the anion. And then an electrolyte is a substance that undergoes just partial dissociation. Um, and there's some examples of those down here. So yeah, drink your Gatorade. Uh, dissolution or disassociation. So. Um, uh, there's the acid-base chemistry is a big part of uh, aqueous chemistry, and so this is saying that when hydrochloric acid, the gas, dissolves into becoming aqueous hydrochloric acid, so that's aque it's aqueous once it's been dissolved into a solution, and then it dissociates, and it's going to increase the concentration of H plus, uh, and addition of acid to a solution is going to increase H plus, and by definition that decreases pH. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what pH is defined as a bit later on, but um, addition of H plus to a solution makes it more acidic. And then this is sort of the same, but with nitric acid. So uh, nitric acid, the gas, dissolves into water or a solution and becomes the aqueous form. And then it will dissociate into the cation, which is H plus, and the anion, NO3 minus. Uh, so yeah. pH is literally defined as the negative log, base 10, of the concentration of H plus. And the concentration of H plus, in this case, is in units of molarity. And molarity is moles per liter. So that is, um, and moles, that is by definition 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. That makes up a mole. Uh, that's Avogadro's number. Maybe you get some of you guys recognize that from chemistry. But. Um, so because it's the negative log 10, it's going to mean that higher H plus means lower pH, and that is a more acidic solution. So uh, we can talk about water in these terms. So if you just have only water, that's H2O, water is going to dissociate into H plus and OH minus. <coughs> And so in a given solution of water, you have a concentration of H plus and of OH minus, because they come in equal ratios, of H plus of 10 to the negative 7 molarity. And if you take the pH of that, that's going to be 7. So 10 to the negative 7, the way you do this is 10 raised, do you guys know log stuff? OK, cool. Never mind. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, so as a result, the water is going to have a pH of 7. And I um, just wanted to, oh yeah, yeah, OK. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. But remember, water has a pH of 7. So um, an acid, sort of going off of those other things that we were just talking about, an acid is a substance that, when added to a solution, is going to increase the H plus and decrease the pH. So um, a strong acid is going to be one that just gives off its H plus really easily. And a weak acid is going to be one that holds on to its H plus, because that way it's not going to be able to give it off and have the H plus floating around the solution. So a strong acid is one that dissociates quickly. Uh, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, and nitric acid are good examples of strong acids. Hydrochloric acid is um, stomach acid. So. Uh, Weak acid is one that dissociates less readily, and that is carbonic acid. And uh, I'll touch on that just very briefly. And a base, sort of the opposite, is one that when added to a solution is going to reduce H plus, and that's going to increase the pH. It's going to reduce the H plus by introducing OH minus, which are going to react together to form water. OK. Any questions about that? OK, cool. Uh, and then this is the pH scale. So we said that water, distilled pure water, is pH 7. And so we think of pH on a scale from 0 to 14, typically. Um, so battery acid, really low down, is 1.0. Lemon juice is 2.2. I think stomach acid is typically between 2 and 3 pH. 
And pH is on a log scale, so every tick you multiply by 10. So a pH of 7 is 10 times more acidic, 10 times less acidic than a pH of 6. And moving this way, each tick is 10 times more of the concentration of H plus in the solution. Uh, and then rainwater is 5 to 5.6, so it's not pure water. Seawater is 7.8 to 8.3, also not pure water. So um, we could talk about seawater. Um, that's just basically because there's lots of things in the ocean which produce calcium carbonate, um, which is alkaline, which leads to um, increased base. But uh, for rainwater, at least, it's this production of acids as atmospheric constituents get dissolved into rain droplets or cloud droplets or whatever else. So um, this is why rain is slightly acidic. And it's also why there's an issue with ocean acidification. So even though the ocean is currently more basic than it is acidic, there is a trend of acidification of the oceans. So um, CO2, the gas, which is increasing right now due to combustion engines and just reached 400 ppm uh, a couple months ago, or maybe it was it was last spring or something like that. Uh, so that dissolves into the water to make aqueous <coughs> CO2. And then CO2 plus water, that's going to become carbonic acid, H2CO3. And then H2CO3 can dissociate up to two times, once to make this bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus, and one to make the carbonate ion, CO3 two minus. Um, so as we add more H plus, um, into, the, into the oceans, you get a, a shift between these three stages towards a more acidic state. Um, so yeah, so this is why rainwater is acidic, is because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will dissolve into a water droplet, and then it'll react with that water to form carbonic acid. So that acidifies the water. And yeah, and so similarly, I think it's coming up. This is what happened with sulfuric acid. So this was the acid rain. This is how um, water got acidified in the production of acid rain. So sulfuric acid uh, dissolves into aqueous sulfuric acid, and then that can also dissociate up to two times, releasing its hydrogen ions and acidifying the water. Um, yeah. And this sulfuric acid is. Uh, well, when they talk, there's like sort of there's some experiments right now, or ideas at least to do geoengineering, which is where we emit via a high flying plane or something like that a bunch of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere, and since it will become particulate quickly, it can then start reflecting light back out uh, and trying to cool the planet a little bit, um, which is, uh, has been a very controversial topic. Um, and this is the last slide. <laughs> so this is just talking about some of the health effects from some of the stuff that we were talking about. Uh, again, PM10 and PM2.5 are, uh, that's referring to the size of the particles. And that's generally how people try to talk about these and characterize them. But um, some of the hazardous compounds and particles are, yeah, well, benzene, um, yeah, I think benzene's a, a Reproductive toxin, something like that. Uh, yeah, metals, you can get obviously lung injury. This is also in regions, I mean, they, they, these kinds of things will influence uh, developing lungs more readily than non developed lungs. So, a lot of this, like asthma and things like emphysema and lung cancer, uh, as they relate to air pollution, uh, are influencing the kids more than anyone else. Uh, and then, total air pollution mortality is 2.5 to 3 million deaths per year, and that's thought to be due mostly to, to particulate pollution. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Cool. Thanks for coming. <laughs>